it is now my pleasure <laughs> to introduce uh, our keynote, um, um, the Lotus Sutra Creating a Buddhist Scripture, that will be given by Professor Stephen Kaiser. Um, now, Professor Kaiser is Suzuki Professor in Buddhist Studies at Princeton University. His works uh, trace the interaction between Buddhism and Chinese traditions using textual, but also artistic and material remains uh, from the Silk Road. Uh, he, his most recent books are a monograph, which is in Chinese, on Buddhism and the study of ritual, the Ilu Yi Fujiao Yanjio, uh, the ritual and the study of Buddhism, uh, published this year, and an English translation of uh, Hao Chun Wen's uh, Tunghuang manuscripts, an introduction to texts from the Silk Road. And he has also uh, completed last, um, last year uh, a project on Tunghuang art and manuscripts, uh, a four-year project of conferences and publications on Buddhist art and manuscripts of the Silk Road. So I will now uh, hand over to um, Professor Kaiser and um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Menegon. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of the organizers, uh, the, the whole team that has put this together. I thank the sponsors uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, in the area uh, who, as uh, Mr. Keating already pointed out, have, have braved the cold and many other uh, perils uh, to get here. And I also want to thank everyone joining online uh, from who are braving the, the perils of different time zones and internet connectivity. My title slide uses the image that our organizers also used for their uh, uh, program. Uh, it is Stein Manuscript 2181. Uh, it's a little bit under the, uh, under the projection screen here. In the bottom left, you can see the, the beginnings of that shelf mark on the screen here in London. It's dated to 676, and it has only recently been digitized by the Lotus Sutra Manuscript Digitalization Project. What does it say, and why is that important? How is it relevant to my topic of creating Buddhist scripture? I hope we'll get to these questions and discuss them further, but first I want to lay out some of the questions I want to address today. Who created the Lotus Sutra? How was the scripture understood both as an eternal truth and at the same time as it was recreated in countless material forms in medieval China? Who was the author or original speakers and later creators of the text? Who produced it in material form and in what media? How was it preached? How was it recited? How was it understood? How was it practiced? How many versions existed? Which ones were popular? What did believers think about the text and how did they make it come alive? To get to these questions, I wanna first talk about some of the teachings of the Lotus Sutra. This is not a manuscript from Dunhuang on the screen. This is, uh, I think, uh, one, of the, one of the most impressive uh, frontispieces of the Lotus Sutra in manuscript form. It's a Korean manuscript held in the Met Museum in New York City, uh, dating from about 1340. Uh, it shows on the right, it's a frontispiece, as you can see, to uh, the, uh, the second scroll, that's uh, chapter three of the Lotus Sutra. It shows in the preaching scene on the right, the Buddha surrounded by uh, bodhisattvas and disciples, 
preaching to five disciples on the platform in front of him. That's the frontispiece in the introduction to the text. At the top middle and top left is the parable from the chapter three of the Lotus Sutra of the burning house. And we see the burning house at left and the children who were playing inside the house who have been coaxed out of the house by their father on the right. They've been coaxed out because they succumbed to the promises of the toys that they most enjoy playing with, an ox cart, a deer cart, uh, and a goat cart out front. At the bottom left is a, an illustration of the succeeding chapter uh, of the prodigal son uh, who, re who returns home. The teachings, in, especially in chapters two and three of the Lotus Sutra, are central and I think very helpful in understanding the question of creating the Buddhist scripture. Because they show us first that there are a plurality of methods within the Buddhist tradition. The message in chapter two of the Lotus Sutra is as given by the Buddha is that nirvana is not the end all and be all. The Buddha proclaims, I made a show, a play, an expedient device of nirvana, but in fact, I'm not extinct. My nirvana was there as a device and as an encouragement to earlier disciples, and now I'm going to reveal a fuller truth, a more complete understanding. And the more complete understanding of the Buddhist truth, all teachings bestowed by the Buddha are equally valid. All are equally expedient, and all are included in the one great vehicle or the great vehicle of Mahayana. If we were to translate this into Sanskrit, we would say, number one, that nirvana is not final, it was only displayed for the sake of shravakas or voice hearers. And number two, all upaya, all expedient devices are equally valid. As the text of chapter three itself says, seek as you will in all 10 directions, there is no other vehicle aside from the expedient devices of the Buddha. How does this relate to creating Buddhist scripture? It relates because, first of all, not only is the Buddha in some sense eternal, but his teachings are eternally recreated again and again. Hence, creators or speakers or authors of the text pop up everywhere with equal validity. We see this recapitulated at the very beginning of the Lotus Sutra. So here I'm back to a Dunhuang manuscript, Stein 437. The beginning of this text is complete, and it wasn't easy to find this slide. It wasn't easy to find an illustrated scroll, uh, a scroll from Dunhuang of the Lotus Sutra with the beginning of the text intact. And that's because most of the scrolls that survive from Dunhuang, including of canonical texts like the Lotus Sutra, when they're rolled up, the beginning is on the outside, and as the outside, as the, as the text decays, and as the weather and, and life in general takes its toll on the life of the manuscript, it's the outside, it's the beginning of the text, it's the beginning of the first piece of the text that is decayed. So this is one of the exceptions we actually have in, in maybe a dozen or so manuscripts from chapter one, the actual first words of the text. As, as you all know, they begin with the classic words spoken by the Buddha's chief disciple, Ananda. Thus have I heard, at one time the Buddha was dwelling in the city of Rajagriha on Gurdakuta mountain together with 12,000 great bhikshus. All were arhats, etc., etc. This is important because it vouches in the first place for the authenticity of what is to follow. It was heard by the Buddha's disciple, 
Ananda at a certain place. It was heard directly from the teacher's mouth. And it's repeated verbatim in what follows. This is depicted, perhaps, in this astounding embroidery, more than six feet tall, which may or may not depict Shakyamuni preaching on Vulture Peak. I think the jury is still out on that question. I've always thought that it does portray the beginning of the Lotus Sutra and other sutras spoken on Mount on Vulture Peak. Uh, we see the Buddha uh, with gestures that are supposed to be standard for Vulture Peak in the center. We see him surrounded uh, by uh, at the two bodhisattvas and his closer at hand, his two disciples. Whether or not this is really Vulture Peak uh, is, is given some further support by an accompanying silk painting, an additional silk painting, which I've shown the whole painting on the bottom left and the detail of the vulture from it in the middle. Hence, we have not only the, the sutra itself providing in its opening passage an explanation of who is speaking it, on whose authority, when was it spoken, how did it originate, but we also have portrayals of the beginning of the text itself. But there are more than simply Ananda and the Buddha, the Shakyamuni Buddha, speaking in the Lotus Sutra. There are many speakers in the Lotus Sutra. There are many occasions when the Lotus Sutra has been taught in the past. And this is just a partial list that you see on this slide. Most importantly, I would draw your attention to the speakers, the originators, the creators of the Lotus Sutra pointed out in my point number five, which is drawing from chapter 11 of the Lotus Sutra, welling up the appearance of the jeweled stupa out of the earth. Chapter 11 opens with the earth splitting open, in effect, and a stupa welling up out of the earth in which uh, a voice out of which a voice emerges. It's the voice of another Buddha, many jewels Buddha, Prabhupada Ratna, who is also preaching the Lotus Sutra and has always been, been preaching the Lotus Sutra. He vows, made a vow long in the past to appear in his stupa whenever the Lotus Sutra is being, in effect, re-preached. So, here is Prabhupada Ratna appearing as a witness, himself having spoken the Lotus Sutra in the past, bearing witness to the speaking again of the Lotus Sutra, the revelation of the Lotus Sutra again in the present. We see the same testimony provided by Prabhupada Ratna, many jewels Buddha, about the preaching and re-preaching of the Lotus Sutra. We see it displayed in artistic form. Uh, certainly at Dunhuang on Mogal, Dun Mogal cave paintings. This is one of the, the nicest ones for dating from the eighth century. And we see in the very center of this composition, uh, the stupa with many jewels Buddha on the left and Shakyamuni Buddha on the right. Many jewels Buddha shares the seat so that the, the twin Buddhas in effect uh, are shown uh, creating and recreating the Lotus Sutra. The same scene is, is depicted in other forms in the Sutra itself, in the illustrated versions of the Sutra. And I'd like to look at a couple illustrated versions of the Lotus Sutra from Dunhuang to see how they portray this scene. I need to introduce another episode, another chapter. Uh, it will be a, an important subject for other, other papers in our conference in these two days, and that is chapter 25. Guan Shi Yin Pu Sa Pu Man Ping, the uh, 25th chapter on Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva uh, and his gate of universal deliverance. Uh, 
The plot of that chapter is to focus on the saving graces and the saving powers of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. But even that chapter, which is illustrated here in a scroll format, even that chapter makes reference to the broader story of the Lotus Sutra as a whole. So the primary focus is Avalokiteshvara, but the broader reference is to the beginning of the Lotus Sutra and its preaching by Shakyamuni Buddha. So we see that in, the, in what I've dubbed here scene one. It is the first scene in the chapter. It shows the Buddha in the center, flanked by two monks and two bodhisattvas. Standard preaching scene for the Lotus Sutra as a whole. But then the interlocutors in this particular chapter are shown in scene two. Two of them are shown here. That is the bodhisattva inexhaustible mind interacting with the Buddha. How does this chapter fold in, refer to, tie itself to the broader teaching of the Lotus Sutra? It does so by drawing on the story of, uh, of, of Prabhuta Ratna, of many jewels bodhisattva. So this particular chapter of the Lotus Sutra has a bodhisattva questioning the Buddha. It's the bodhisattva inexhaustible the mind, uti e uh, in dialogue with the Buddha, talking about the powers of Avalokiteshvara. In the process of that discussion, there's a, a dramatic encounter. There's some actual action that takes place, and the action is uh, uh, inexhaustible mind makes an offering to Avalokiteshvara. Avalokiteshvara declines the offering. There's a back and forth with the Buddha. Finally, Avalokiteshvara accepts the offering, but in turn hands it over to Prabhuta Ratna, many jewels Buddha, and Shakyamuni, as if Avalokiteshvara himself had to defer and give honor to the two key Buddhas who have been the, the perennial teachers of the Lotus Sutra. And so that's what we see in this illustrated booklet. It's, a, again, an illustrated booklet. We saw a scroll just before, and now we see the booklet, a booklet illustrating the entire chapter on Avalokiteshvara, chapter 25. And these are uh, midway through the illustrations in 22 verso. You see at right, uh, the layman is imploring, a layman is imploring the Buddha. In, in 23 recto, uh, Avalokiteshvara, I think that's Avalokiteshvara on the right, is offering a necklace to the Buddha. We turn the page to 23 verso, and we see a layman worshiping Avalokiteshvara. And on 24 recto, we see a layman worshiping different beings and asking them to also convince Avalokiteshvara to accept the offering. The story, this part of the story concludes in the next couple pages. 24 verso, inexhaustible mind bodhisattva. I believe that's the person, the being wearing the crown on the right, offers the necklace again to Avalokiteshvara in 25 recto. we see, finally, the two beings who receive the necklace in the end. We see Shakyamuni Buddha and, and many jewels Buddha with the stupa between them. And then we see a standard scene of worship in the next two illustrations. The point here, my point in drawing attention to these illustrations, is that this chapter brings more speakers of the text it brings more creators of the Dharma proclaimed in the Lotus Sutra to the scene. And they perform not just simply as speakers, but as carrying out actions that give honor to those who are involved in, in creating and reproducing the Lotus Sutra. I want to use this uh, discussion of recreation to move to later creators how was the text, how was the teaching transmitted after its first utterances? And it was uttered, of course, many times. But how were those teachings in turn passed down? 
Well, the standard way to answer that question is in Buddhist studies is to look at who is credited with translating the text and what do their translations look like. Uh, by the 5th and 6th centuries, it, uh, certainly by the end of the 7th century, it had already become a standard story that there were at least six different translation teams active who worked on the Lotus Sutra translation from an Indian la Indic languages uh, into Chinese over the centuries, and that three of those translations survived into the 6th century and down to the present in Chinese. Uh, as you can see, they were by uh, first one by Dharma Raksha, uh, the second one by Kumarajiva uh, in eight scrolls and 28 chapters, and the third one by the two masters, Jnana Gupta and Dharma Gupta in the Sui dynasty. I show this in order to demonstrate that already early on there were many variations in the content and in the organization of the Lotus Sutra text. How many chapters did the Lotus Sutra have? How many different, how many scrolls did it take to fit those 28 or 27 or 30 chapters? All of these were open questions, much discussed, but never fully resolved. Dunhuang materials provide some great evidence about precisely this question, and they provide unique information. I never knew there were 30 chapters of the Lotus Sutra. I always thought there were 28. But this manuscript, actually the back of this Dunhuang manuscript, tells us that there are 30 chapters. This is Stein 2092. The, the recto side, the, the proper side of 20, Stein 2092 is a Jingguang Ming Wangjing, a Suvarna Pravasa Sutra with a phonetic glossary, perfectly good canonical text. It's a, lovely, it's a lovely production. But I'm interested on the other side because on the other side is a table of contents of the Lotus Sutra that lists its 30 chapters with titles. It lists the first 28 that we know from the Kumarajiva or the succeeding Yanagupta compilations, but then it adds two more chapters. It adds a chapter 29 on Duliang Tian Di Ping, uh, measurements of heaven and earth, and a chapter 30 on Ashvagosha Bodhisattva. But it's even better than that. The Dunhuang Corpus provides examples of chapters 29 and chapters 30. Here's chapter 29, one, one small section of it. So it's entitled Measurements of Heaven and Earth. And the, the content is, is, is interesting. It runs through various levels of the Buddhist cosmos and, and, and then connects Lotus Sutra practice to each level of the cosmos. Uh, so it's, it's not a repetition of what's in the Lotus Sutra exactly but it certainly makes reference to practicing the Lotus Sutra and says, if you uphold the Lotus Sutra and make offerings to it or preach it, then the result will be a pleasant rebirth in such and such a heaven. And in being described here happens to be the 20th heaven. And then after this, it goes on to the 21st heaven and so forth. So there were not simply many speakers of the Lotus Sutra within the text. There were not simply many translators of the Lotus Sutra who took previous versions and reinterpreted them, represented them. There were also new chapters of the Lotus Sutra being produced. And some of those productions came from people we wouldn't normally expect to be producers of Buddhist scriptures. For instance, historical records compiled by Buddhist historians preserve this well-known story of a young seven-year-old girl. Her name was Nidza. We know where and when she lived. And she is credited with having been inspired to reveal 
new chapters and new texts from the Buddhist canon. There's a debate already in the sixth century about whether she did this by ascending to other levels of the cosmos to interact with deities or to receive teachings as is often done in Buddhist legends from say Maitreya, uh, from uh, say Nagarjuna. Uh, in this case, we don't know. The, the, the authorities in her case disagreed. Some say, uh, as you can see in the historical account here, some said at the time that she ascended to the heavens. Others said that uh, deities descended into her and recited or revealed chapters of the lotus chapters of the Lotus, but also other texts. There are a total of four sutras she is credited with having re revealed or received through inspired speech. They were then written down because presumably she was in some state of possession. It's unclear whether she knew how to read and write, but she knew that she knew how to speak and her speech was treated as inspired speech. So it was recorded and the records were passed down. So there are authors outside of the normal channels that we would expect for the transmission of Buddhist texts, their translation and recreation. So that's a bit about the creation of the Lotus Sutra, creators involved in speaking, uh, involved in revealing, involved in translating the text. But there are other questions, There's, uh, there are other possibilities for creating a text other than simply getting the words right. The words have to be put in some material form. They have to be put on paper, they have to be voiced, they have to be enacted in some way or another. And so that's another kind of creation that I'd like to turn to for a moment. And I'd like to draw on a scholar uh, who writes about uh, biblical materials, uh, but he does so in a comparative and theoretical vein. That's Vincent L. Wimbush. Uh, and he talks, uh, he, he talks about the process of uh, scripturalizing as a broader term for a process that, that occurs uh, for many religious texts or even non-religious texts. Wimbush poses the questions as, as you can see here. How are scriptures represented or symbolized? In what materials? Through what expressive forms? With what types of practices, rituals, and performances are scriptures associated? How are scriptures engaged, manipulated, and performed? That's the broader and comparative way to frame the question, but we have very good Buddhist ways of also framing the same question and theorizing about the same process. One of the key ways, uh, and this is from the Fa Shi Pi, I think that's chapter 10 of the Lotus Sutra. Um, one, of the, one of the standard ways in the Lotus Sutra, I say one of the standard because there are many ways of, of phrasing this broader practice of scripturalization in the Lotus Sutra. Um, but it comes here uh, in chapter 10. Uh, it's, it's highlighted in, in Chinese. I've tried to highlight it here. It's the, the, the phrases, Shou chi du song jie shuo, shu xie, which get interpreted in, in different ways. And, and as I understand it, the, there are different uh, ways of part, there are different ways that Chinese commentators parse the Chinese and understand these terms. And there are also, uh, in, in Sanskrit versions of the Lotus and other languages, there are, there are still other ways of, uh, in which the, the activity of upholding the Lotus Sutra was described. Um, let me just read it, read it quickly in English. If a good man or good woman shall uphold, read, recite, preach, or copy a single phrase of the scripture, the Dharma blossom, or in various ways make offerings, gong yang, to the scriptural scroll of flower perfume, necklaces, powdered incense, perfumed paste, burned incense, silks, lanterns, and canopies, garments, or music, or join palms in veneration, gong jing. That person 
is to be looked up to and exalted by all the world, showered with offerings fit for a thus company. So here is one formulation for how to uphold scripture. This general formulation, I put the Lotus Sutra in this slide, I put the Lotus Sutra formulation on the left, and I've, I followed the interpretation of most medieval, com most medieval Chinese commentators. They interpret, for instance, Chocher as one activity, upholding. They, in they interpret Du as a second activity of reading, and Song as a third activity of reciting, although it's possible to read those two terms together as one. And a fourth term, preaching, Jie Shuo, and a fifth activity of copying. Later tradition, uh, accounts of the Lotus Sutra's efficacy and biographies of practitioners who upheld the Lotus Sutra down to modern times use some version of this categorization, but they often make innovations. They might add Hua um, Xiang, uh, illustrating. They might add um, uh, contemplating, Xiu Guan, practicing contemplation based on the Lotus Sutra or Tiantai teachings. Um, but they, they all agree that there is a framework for practicing the Lotus Sutra, for putting the Lotus Sutra into practice, most of which involves some material and bodily engagement. Let's look to, again, Dunhuang materials for evidence of how that process of creation in the sense of materializing the text or bringing the text into material form, how did that take place? And again, the Dunhuang manuscripts give us bounteous examples of how that process works. This is Stein 3510, uh, dated uh, 721. Uh, Kai Yuan. Um, it's the scroll number five from the Lotus Sutra, and we see here the colophon at the end. And you see it has two short colophons. Uh, the first one is shorter, and it reads, uh, upheld by pure disciple Yin Xuan Dan. Um, second colophon, uh, so I interpret the first colophon as, as, as be expressing the, the wishes of the donor or the sponsor of this copying process project, uh, copying out this text. But then the second colophon gives evidence of the practicing of the Lotus Sutra by a second person who practiced it. It has already been commissioned. The copying of it had already been commissioned by the first donor. So the second donor, the second practitioner, engages with it by reading aloud. And he says the whole canon, Zhuan, Yi Qie Jing, Yi Bian, read the whole canon or all the scriptures once. So here we have the Dunhuang materials giving us evidence not only about writing, xie, but also about reciting the Lotus Sutra. How might that have looked? Perhaps it looked like this. This is not a Lotus Sutra illustration. It's an uh, illustration of the Bao Yu Jing, the Jewel Reigning Sutra. Um, from the seventh century, Mogao Cave 321, but it clearly shows uh, uh, one person reading aloud and another person writing down or copying. And you can see the details on the person's, especially the second person's face, as well as the brush that he holds in his hand as he does the copying. Similar idea, vocalize it and write it down. How is chanting done? Perhaps it was done like this. This, again, is not uh, an example from the Lotus Sutra. This is a side panel on a Baishajal Guru par paradise scene, a, a Yaoshifo paradise scene uh, from uh, Stein painting 36, held in the British Museum. Uh, and it shows two monks at the top. They're clearly the the, the members of this scene we're supposed to engage with. Why? Because they're looking at us uh, most directly. We see their faces, and they are engaged in, they're holding up a text scroll and reading it aloud. They're, they're reading aloud uh, the, the Vaishaja Guru Sutra. Um, and they're doing so for the benefit of the 
the sick person shown there, supported by a family member, but also we see two young members of the household trying to follow along uh, at the bottom in, in the reading, in the chanting aloud of this text for the purposes of curing illness. But chanting was done not only by monks, it was done by lay people, as we see here, probably a Lotus Sutra tableau uh, uh, on Dunhuang Mogao Cave 103 from the 8th century, which shows a lay person seated and a lay person standing, reading the text aloud on behalf of the three figures on the right, who are probably uh, three generations, three women, uh, from women from three different generations uh, of the family on the right. So chanting is also done by lay people, as we see here. Uh, chanting is one way to uh, perform the text, recreate the text, bring it into being. Uh, there's another way to perform the text, and that is to preach on it. And here again, the Dunhuang materials give us unique and unparalleled information about how that process took place. Uh, this is, uh, th there are four, among all the Dunhong collections, I believe there are four uh, manuscripts that contain this text, which is a sutra lecture text on the Lotus Sutra. Miao Fa Lian Hua Jing, a Jiang Jing Ran, literally sutra lecture text. These texts, uh, as you can see, are pretty messy. Uh, most of them are about this messy. Um, most of them uh, reflect uh, an actual performance, uh, an actual speaking performance by a preacher. Uh, and those performances we know, and, and that this text makes clear by virtue of its linguistic uh, features, that there are three different registers of language here, and each was spoken in a different way, in a different tone or manner of voice. There were portions of the sutra that were spoken aloud, essentially recited as sutra text. There were portions that were in uh, uh, poetry, in, in verse, uh, uh, composed by the preacher. Uh, not, not verse quoted from the text, but verse, because text sutras also have prose and verse, but verses created locally on the spot, which were sung, uh, and then portions in, uh, in language that's very close to the vernacular, uh, language, portions that were spoken by the preacher. So we have uh, kind of a, if, if not multimedia, at least, at least a, a, a form of speaking and performance that engages with, with singing and with recitations and with more plain speech. So we've gotten, we've talked about shou chi, upholding, du, reading, song, reciting, shou chi, du, song. Let's talk about shu xie, copying. This wall painting from Yulin, Cave 25, uh, shows a, uh, a person engaged in copying and at bottom and then receiving or, or the next stage in the process of what happens from his effort at copying. He reaps the benefits of that pious act of scripturalization by achieving rebirth in the heavens, presumably in Maitreya's heaven, because it's a Maitreya sutra. But the Dunhuang materials in written form give us plenty of examples as well. Is it a solitary practice? Is it just for literati, as we might expect if we know the, the literati tradition of copying texts, this famous and amazing painting by Chou Ying portraying uh, the recluse scholar uh, Zhao Mengfu copying out the Heart Sutra. Uh, it looks like a solitary or at least uh, effete process. He serves tea. He's enjoying himself. He's taking his time. Dunhuang materials show us a different side of the copying process. 
I'm going to start with the uh, the most humble of the copies and and uh, end with the more involved elite uh, and expensive pr processes of production producing the Lotus Sutra uh, this is uh, one of the simpler it's also it's a lovely piece uh, just just visually speaking and it happens to have a, an intact roller uh, that, that I think is original uh, Stein number uh, 592. As you can see, it's of, of, Jan of, of the second scroll, so it would be chapter three of the Lotus, copied in 689 by a mother on behalf of the afterlife, of the, uh, the salvation of her deceased daughter. Um, but that's not all. Uh, let's read it. In the 12th month of the fourth year of the Choigong era, Madam Chi, wife of Wang Lin, a layman, a pure disciple of the Buddha, respectfully commissioned the copying of one Dharma Blossom Sutra for her deceased daughter. And then she could have stopped there, or the, the, the copyist who wrote this down, who wrote down this prayer on her behalf, could have stopped there with the dedication of merit, saying who, whom is receiving the Good, good effects of this good deed, but she didn't. She kept on going, or he kept on going, and he and he says she prays. That is, she vows. She wishes. She, the the commissioner, the mother, wishes that the deceased, together with sentient beings of the Dharma realm, all sentient beings, all achieve the path to Buddhahood. So merit can be made in the first place for those who have passed away. And that's certainly the, the driving, uh, the biggest engine driving many copies and many ritual, other ritual activities in medieval Buddhist tradition. But benefits could also be dedicated to the nation, to the imperial family, could be dedicated to oneself, the commissioner herself, could be dedicated to one's family, could be dedicated to safe passage when one is traveling. It could be dedicated by individuals. Uh, lay congregations could band together and often did to make other contributions for copying of texts, also amply attested in the Dunhuang materials. Those are some of the simpler ones. Let's look at one of the more, some of the more complex ones. Uh, this is an interesting example. Um, it, it's uh, Stein 3384, the fourth scroll, seventh century text. And uh, the layman is mentioned in at least three, three colophons. Three of his col at least three of his colophons survive. So this one happens to have been text number 889. There's an 890 something also in the Stein collection, and then there's something close to number 1,000 in another collection. So he must have <coughs> copied, had copied out 1,000 copies of the Lotus Sutra at some point, uh, at least three colophons of which survive among the Dunhuang corpus. That's a pretty big project. Bigger still is the example with which we began, Stein 2181. Uh, this is one of 35 Lotus Sutra manuscripts surviving in the Dunhuang corpus that was uh, among all the Dunhuang collections uh, that was copied at the imperial court in Chang'an in between the years 671 and 677. And um, there's excellent scholarship on this in, in English, Chinese, and Japanese. Um, as you can see, it provides a date, Shangyuan Sanyuan, Si Yue Shu Wu It's equivalent to 1st of June, 676. It names the copyist. It names, uh, it states how much paper was used. It says who the mounter was. Uh, it was corrected three times 
uh, by individuals all named here. It was examined four times. Uh, there was a secretary in charge, and then finally there was a director, the, the, the guy at the top involved in this copying project. And, and main, most of the colophons have this level of detail uh, with, with, uh, with names and, and their respective roles of each person participating. Uh, it turns out they were they were they were all pretty important. Um, a Chun Shu uh is is the copyist for this text. That's pretty much something like a junior scribe, um, Yang Wan Tai. Um, the mounter or dyer uh, is is named Jie Ji, and you know, actually, it's the same mounter or, or dyer dyed all 35 copies that survived. So he was he was. There was one main dyer, uh, but but uh, of different different copyists and different um, correctors. The three correctors here uh, are three people. The four examiners, um, Xiang Yue is the verb, uh, Xiang Yue. They were all high monks of Taiyuan Si at the time. Uh, it's a main temple in the capital, and the secretary was a Pan Guan. And then it was overseen or inspected by uh, Yan Xuan Dao, who was uh, quite important. He was the director of the copying office, or the Xie Jing Shi of the time. Um, did this come out of nowhere? Of course not. Uh, this was a big project, um, uh, and it didn't originate out of Buddhist auspices, nor was it a Buddhist creation. This essentially was the third major copying project in these years. It was preceded first by the, co the collation and copying and dissemination of the Chinese classics of the Wu Jing, Shu Shu Yi Li Chun Qiu, Zhuo Zhuan, uh, the five classics of the Confucian tradition or the state education tradition. Uh, the same offices in the capital were used for copying out that imperial project to define a curriculum and send it out uh, to all the schools and to make sure it was distributed throughout the empire. Then uh, the emperor sponsored the, the final translation activities by the uh, uh, most famous Buddhist translator in the world, Xuanzang, uh, uh, who was if not world famous in his own time, has become world famous afterwards because he is the, the, uh, the, the instigator, um, if maybe not the hero, but certainly the instigator of the journey to the West to seek the sutras in the West. Um, and so the copying office was busy copying out Shanzong's translations, um, which were voluminous uh, after the Chinese classics, and then this project. Um, so this this project comes as the third big project in 20 years. Perhaps it's a good comparison to IDP. <laughs> <laughs> now undertaking new projects and new sponsors and new, uh, new uh, organizers uh, as, it continues, um, as it continues. So that's uh, copying of the Lotus. Um, uh, I, I, I want to wrap up. Um, but I, but I want to show you something that I was surprised about uh, as I was uh, preparing this talk. I, it's always a, a, a pleasure to jump back into uh, working on the Lotus Sutra. Uh, and as, so as I was uh, thinking and, and looking through manuscripts on, online, of course, on a, via IDP and, and through other sources, um, I came across a printed version of the Lotus Sutra among the Stein, in the Stein corpus. Um, it's Stein print number 13, this probably dates from the ninth century. You see the print, the end of the print on the left. Um, there may be five, uh, five pages, I didn't reproduce them all here, five sheets of paper. Um, but the first, the beginning of the text is missing, and this is, um, this is chapter 25, it's the Guanyin Jing, it's the Avalokiteshvara chapter of the Lotus. Um, the first couple sheets were missing, um, and so someone, at some time, in, in the long past, in the ninth or 10th century, um, added the beginning of the text, and that's what's on the right, is the, manu the handwritten version done by an earlier editor to supplement what's there. 
think of it as metadata. Think of it as uh, filling in, supplementing, or cross-referencing to provide the, the fuller version of what the whole thing is supposed to be. Um, so that's there as well. So uh, what kind of conclusions can we draw? What kind of conclusions would I draw about creating the Lotus Sutra? Uh, first, I want to look at numbers, uh, but then I want to look uh, at a more qualitative assessment because I think that ultimately that's uh, more, more interesting and more important. Um, the numbers are interesting. Uh, it's, it's always hard to count uh, manuscripts uh, as the curators and as, as well as in anybody in the audience who can, can look at materials online uh, knows because some manuscripts uh, are pieces of paper smaller than this with a few words uh, on them and some manuscripts are 60 feet long with um, an entire uh, sutra on them or a very, very long commentary on them. And so we, we call them all manuscripts and they all, each one of those has a, its own shelf mark uh, among, in the British Library and in other Dunhuang collections. And so it's, it's very hard to compare. It's not, it's not really apples and oranges. It's more like one seed and the whole pomegranate um, or some other uh, apt comparison. Um, nevertheless, um, it, it, it is important to keep tab of numbers. Um, so um, there, one way to calculate the total, I, I've done it very roughly uh, by looking at um, uh, the three sources you see there, Kabuto Gishoko, Fang Guang Chang, uh, and Wu Qi Yu. Um, I take Kabutogi's figures for the Stein and Pelio collections. I've taken uh, Professor Fang's figures for the Beijing Dunhuang collection, and I've taken uh, Wu Qi Yu's for the uh, St. Petersburg collection. And if we follow those numbers, we come up with about 4,000, we come up with 4,465 manuscripts out of all Dunhuang manuscripts that are Lotus Sutra texts. Um, Professor Fong has done uh, uh, further counting. Uh, Professor Fong has spent, spent many, 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 many summer months uh, in the British Library uh, uh, cataloging uh, both the, the first 8,000 and, and the last 8,000, uh, helping and, and uh, over the years uh, working with IDP. And, and his uh, accounting, um, I, I I tend to follow. Um, if we add up all the numbers of manuscripts in the different collections, um, he's also before working in the Stein collection, he was the curator of uh, the Dunhuang collection at Beitou at the Peking National Library. Um, he says roughly 62,000 manuscripts or pieces or shelf marks. Uh, of those, maybe half are of some significant length, like a page pages basically in, the, in, in Tang times was about one foot tall and about two feet wide, um, about 500 characters, um, at, at, at least that long. So of the, those, there, if there are roughly 30,000 significant chunks of texts, of manuscripts, then how many lotus pieces are there? About 5,000 in his counting. So 5,000 out of 30,000 significant chunks of the Dunhuang manuscripts amount to Lotus Sutra copies. But the more important lesson, I think, from uh, the Dunhuang corpus uh, has to do with the diversity of creators and creations of the Lotus Sutra. There were many, many ways of creating the Lotus Sutra, and we see almost all of them represented amply, richly, and uniquely in the Dunhuang corpus. We find humble, unknown, and illiterate donors, people engaging in the commissioning, the copying of the Lotus Sutra. But we also see emperors and state offices and the highest 
monks of the land in the Buddhist hierarchy, sponsoring and engaging in the creation of Buddhist scriptures. We find many examples of the Lotus Sutra that come straight from the canon, and that's certainly the majority of those 5,000 manuscripts. They represent Kumarajiva's translation in different forms, in different formats, not all the same. But we also find non-canonical pieces, chapters of the Lotus Sutra we wouldn't know existed if it weren't for the Dunhuang materials. We find materials that come from, not just from Dunhuang, but that started out in the capital, or if we're looking outside of the Lotus Sutra, the Buddhist materials that started in Khotan, or the Tibetan Empire, or the Uyghur Empire, and ended up at Dunhuang. But they are all creations of the Lotus Sutra. They're all, I would argue, united by devotion to the Lotus Sutra and the broader Buddhist culture that enlivened every corner of the Silk Road. With that, I will hand and thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Thaiser, for this really fascinating talk. I, I feel like we have been taken through a journey, and the Lotus Sutra as a text has become almost alive. Uh, not only uh, the analysis of the compilation and transmission and then translations and dissemination in Asia, but also the, the aspect of uh, performance. I, I think performing the text uh, from uh, reciting or singing or uh, teaching it um, has been really fascinating, really interesting to see 16.7% of the Tunghuang manuscripts are Lotus Sutra. So, and, and I'm very pleased that also by looking at collections, by looking um, at uh, available material in many different um, centers and resources, it, po it is possible really to create and have a new stories around um, such a significant text.